Good day, everybody. Um, welcome. In this lecture, we're going to be talking about Fusion 360 Cam for CNC probing. We're going to be talking about CNC probing from automating part setup to inspecting features directly on your machine. This is probably the hottest topic in CNC right now, and it's a very real way to increase efficiency and decrease machine downtime. So to show us just how sophisticated Fusion Cam has gotten in this area, we've got with us some process specialists from Autodesk UK, Richard Stubley and Spencer Hardcastle. And both of these guys are hardcore CNCers. Um, now, um, as with all our presentations at the expo, this is live and you're encouraged to submit your questions in real time using the chat function. Uh, you can also vote other people's questions to the top of the list. Richard and Spencer are actually going to be addressing questions throughout the presentation, but they'll also have 15 minutes at the end uh, for more questions. So take it away, Richard. Yeah. Hi everyone. Well, good to see you all here today. You might notice my accent slightly different. So um, myself, the same as Spencer, are based out of the UK. So a little bit late for us at the moment. It's pr pretty dark out, out my window, but we're happy to be here with all of you anyway. Um, as we've said before, please ask us questions throughout. We want this to be as, as interactive as possible. If there's any problems with audio or video, let us know as well. Um, we'll do our best to sort it out. We don't want to be, be sat here talking all, all the time and you not actually hear me. So CNC probing with Fusion 360. Um, first of all, a little bit about what we've tried to do with CNC probing. Now, I myself have worked at a company where the probes sat in a box in a cupboard because no one dared use them. You know, we had them with the machine. We sort of knew a little bit about them on the training course, but we never really took it any further than then. We needed the space in the tool changer, so the probes were the first thing that got whipped out, and then they just sat in a box forever. And what we've really tried to do with, uh, you know, making sure that the, the software itself is so intuitive to use and that the posts are safe is the important thing here, is that make sure that you can start using your probes again and for, for so much more than, than what you knew was possible. So quick agenda, we're gonna look at the CAN cycles on our machine. So that's probe WCS for setting our data and then probe geometry for things like updating toolware and stopping the machine if there's an error. One thing to note here, this is part of the extension functionality. That's what that little spanner is. And that's a higher level of manufacturing functionality that you can turn on and off on a cost basis. You know, so you don't need done it every day. You can turn it on as you need it and off as you don't need it. But we'll go, go more about that later. And then something really quite special, special, which is called inspect surface. And this allows you to put any point anywhere on a part, as long as you can reach it with your probe, and inspect that point and find out if it's with or within tolerance. And then finally, a quick thing on manual measure. So this isn't probes, but it complements probes really nicely. So probe WCS. And what is the difference between setting a datum and refining a datum? So the one thing you've got to bear in mind here is we can't just put a block of material on our machine, press cycle start and hope that we find it. That we've got to have told the machine first, we've got to set our G54 roughly where it should be. But we can then command our probe to go in, probe that part relative to that original coordinate system and refine that datum. So please don't think that you can start chucking your blocks of material on your machine, programming it in Fusion and pressing go. You still do need to roughly set the datum first and then use the automatic probing cycles to refine it. So again, personally speaking as openly as I can, I wouldn't use this for a one-off part, but anything more than a one-off, definitely I would be using this. So again, try and be as honest as I can, ask the questions in the chat and we'll work through this all together. Let's have a quick look at Fusion. So we've got this lovely part here, this bottle opener. For anyone that's ever seen me do a demo before, you're probably sick and tired of this bottle opener now, but I do love it. So we've got two operations here. We've got a probe Z and we've got a probe XY. So that's gonna set the Z of our billet and the XY. Now, little top tip here, something that I do, I always tend to model up my stock. I just prefer it that way. So let's just go in and let's turn that on so we can really see what's going on here. So I've got our probe Z there and that probe XY. Let's just interrogate what we've got going on here. And let's edit that. So we've got our probe operation. 
And then we've got our geometry. So all I would have done is selected that face. So let's see how I actually would create that toolpath. Let's get rid of these two and let's make this from scratch. I've got a whole inspection tab up here. So you can see how seriously we take inspection in Fusion 360. It's got its own tab. So I've got Probe WCS. You might also recognize this from here as well. It's exactly the same command from the setup, just moved up into here. I go my geometry and I select this top face. The first thing it's gonna do now is it's gonna guess that I wanna do an XY rectangle. And that's fine, that's what I'll do in this case. I'll probe that XY rectangle just here. What I wanna do though is look at my approach and over travel here though. I've uh, intentionally moved these defaults around so I can sort of show you what's going on. The approach move is how far before the contact point do we start measuring? So you've got to think about this. If you're milling apart, you know, you've got your, you've got your milling cutter and it's going to mill your part. What you've got to have here is it's going to go exactly on the line and it's going to mill that part. But when you're probing, you don't know exactly where the part is. That's the reason why you're probing it. So we have to start slightly before where we think the part is. That's called our approach move. So let me dial that down to about three millimeters because I think my part's going to be about, at the worst case, three millimeters out. And I'm going to do the same for my over travel because the same thing, the part is just as likely to be bigger or out in one direction than the part is going to be smaller and out in the opposite direction. So the over travel is how far past the perfect point does it keep traveling before it gives up and goes, hang on a minute, guys, there's something going wrong here. Please shout us up some questions if any of this is not making sense. So what I've got now, I'm going to probe the X and Y of this part and set, you know, my G54 bang in the center there. I'm going to hit OK. I now need to do my Z as well. So I'm going to do exactly the same as before. I'm going to go probe WCS, choose the top, but I don't want to do an XY. I want to do a Z surface. Now, one thing to bear in mind here is that it defaults to the center of this block because we know a lot of the time people do want to probe bang in the center. But what I can do is I can grab that point and I can put it there if I really wanted to. But, you know, I can leave that point anywhere I want it. It's not a problem. And I'm going to hit OK again. Let's give these two both a quick meaningful name. Let's just call this probe XY. And then let's call this one here probe Z. I want to put these at the top. Now the ordering does make a big difference. And I'm going to go for Z first and then for X, Y. And there's a good reason behind that. Let's have a quick look at this probe path. We can see here that we're touching around about this portion on our block. But what if this is out in Z, wrong? If the block's too high or too low, I could actually end up missing that and maybe catching like a burr on the top potentially, because these are sawn off billets that I put in my machine. So making sure that I probe Z first is actually gonna make sure that I set the datum in Z and then I go in and set the X and Y, because of course it's affecting that datum all the time as I go along. Right, there's a couple more things we can do as well. As you've already gonna spend the time, you're gonna invest the time in probing on the machine we can do a lot more than just check for position and measure it. Let's edit this probe XY. What I've got here is two tolerances in position and in size. So this is basically saying when I measure that block, if it's out of position by over a millimeter plus or minus, I want to stop the machine with an alarm. And the same for size. Let's drop size down to half a millimeter though. We then go over to the actions tab and I've got these lovely two tick boxes here. So I can now tick out of position and tick wrong size. And what's going to happen now when I probe on the machine tool using the can cycles that are on there, it's going to measure that X and Y. And if it's out of position more than my tolerance, it's going to flag up an alarm. The same thing for wrong size as well. Because bear in mind, when I make these bottle openers, and I normally make about three or 400 a year for different demos and different things, we just get a three meter long length that's cut up 
into 100 millimeters long. And depending on who's been on the bandsaw, sometimes I get the bar end thrown in. Um, so I've got potentially a small billet in my box and that's gonna cause a scrap part. Worst case, if it's a bigger billet, you've got to think that first roughing pass around the outside is maybe even gonna snap my tool. So I can not only set my datum, I can also verify the size and position of that block as I go as well. Again, this is all done from inside of Fusion. If you needed to have done these commands before, you need to know, I think one of them's a H value. The other one might be, I, mean, I don't even know what the other value is that you have to put through in the NC code. So rather than having to hand edit your NC code to do these sorts of checks, it's as simple as checking your box on there. So we mainly support all the Renishaw cycles, but we've also got um, the posts out there for, for Siemens, Heiden, Heiden and Blum. Um, and hopefully the, the level of functionality is what you've got on the machine. What we've normally found is that, you know, some cycles don't do everything others do, but we try and give you the opportunity here to actually be able to do everything on the controller um, that could be possible. We've got one last tick box I want to talk about, and that's override driving WCFs. What this does is allow us to set a different datum for our probing than what's on our milling. So anyone that uses Fusion knows that you set your datum up here in the setup. So if I look at here in the setup, I've got that as one, which equates to G54. So all my milling is gonna be output to G54. If I tick override driving WCS here, what that's saying is I want it to actually change the, 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 the coordinate system that the probe has been driven from. I don't want the probe to be driven from G54, I want it to be driven from G55. Now bear that in mind, we'll have a quick look at some pictures um, right now. So hopefully that will make a bit more sense. Let's have a quick look at what this actually looks like on the machine though. So we've got our block there in our machine and our probe comes over. It's gonna do our X, Y. Now I'll go back to the whole point, we're trying to make probing as easy as possible. Now, did you know that this is actually two CAN cycles on the machine? There is no rectangular block. It has to combine an X web with a Y web. And again, you don't want to be knowing that. You just want to be able to click in Fusion and do it for you manually. You know, there's a reason why we use CAM systems. And it's so we don't have to know every bit of G code inside out. So brilliant. We've just set our datum, everything's gone correctly, and we can now go on and actually machine our part. So we can see how easy that was. Again, I make 400 of these, you know, when I go to an expo or a demo, we normally do them live, but we can't at the moment, of course. And I'm chucking these in the machine while chatting to someone else. I misload these all the time. But that probing operation catches those misloads if I don't catch them myself. They're really important. We go back to that override driving WCS. Here we see it in a little bit more detail. So what we can see is that our milling there for the top face operation, you know, we look down here at block N95, that's been commanded to run at G54. And our probing is updating G54. That's where that S1 comes from. Again, you don't want to know it's S1. You just want to be able to put it in Fusion and get it output. But bear in mind, the probe is being driven from G55. Now, why is this so important? Why, why do we want to, what looks like, overcomplicate things? And it's because we want to make our new part relative to a static datum rather than the new part relative to the last part. So on the left, we can see what happens when WCS override is turned off. We've got our perfect datum, you know, our absolute ideal location for that billet sat here. I make my first part and it moves my datum to there. So I've suddenly lost my perfect datum. It now does the second one, which is over here, third, fourth, fifth, that datum is now bouncing around our table. And that's really bad news. Any machinist out there knows that variation is our worst enemy. So let's have a look when WS override is on. So this datum is G55, and then I update G54 here. But G55 stays where it was. I've got my second part. G55 stayed where it was and moves and updates G54. 
I really hope that's making sense. Please hit us up in the chat if there are any questions. How are we doing, Spence? Yeah, hi, everybody. Uh, hi, Rich. Good job so far. Awesome presentation. We've got a couple of questions come in for you. Uh, first one is, uh, what are the benefits over of, of what you're showing today versus actually just making the part on the machine and then using a CMM? Okay, yeah, I've got that one. I'll, I'll answer that one in a minute. Go for the next one. And then question two is, and I think this could probably be split into two questions. The question reads, is this possible to do with my older Fidal machine? Fidal, so I, yeah. I would take that as, do we have capabilities to run Fidal machines with, this, with the probing functionality? And then secondly, um, will this work on older, older machines, generally speaking? Okay, perfect. So a lot of what I've shown you now is running on what we call third-party canned cycles. So this is going to rely on either your pro manufacturer or the machine manufacturer installing can cycles on the machine itself. We're then calling those can cycles for them to be executed as we go. So the question is more, if you've got the can cycles, then we can, we've hopefully got a post processor out there that will call them. If not, it would be quite an easy post mod for you to either do it yourselves or to get in touch with a reseller who could then do those post mods for you to call those can cycles. But a lot of the onus here is making sure those can cycles are on your machine and working. If they're not there, we, we can't call them, unfortunately. In a few slides time, I'll show you some different kind of inspection that you don't need those can cycles for, but we'll explain that as we go. So question one now um, was about the, the CMM question. So what I'm showing here is setting up a part on a machine tool. A CMM definitely can't do that. A CMM can't tell you if you've incorrectly loaded the billet on your machine. And the big thing here as well is not every shop's got a CMM and you don't want your CMM to be, you know, driving your production. Um, you know, you want to be able to put the part on the machine, measure it quickly. You know, me as a machinist, I want to take control over my own quality. I'm never saying that machines will, you know, re remove the need for CMMs. CMMs will always have a need. Um, but what you want to do is make the two complement one another. When I show us some of the more inspection stuff later on in the presentation, I'll talk about, you know, the difference in the in-process checks. So what I do now is I measure my first off on the machine. I then measure the same part on the CMM and I check that the two match up together. At the end of the day, you have to calibrate a CMM. So why can't you calibrate a machine tool using the same processes? So I'm not saying that it's going to get rid of the CMM, but it's definitely going to take some of the weight off your CMM. I mean, I don't know what other people's shops are out there like, but where I used to work, the CMMs only ever ran on day shift. So if there's ever a problem on the night shift, they had to wait until the morning or run the whole night, hoping that we hadn't been making scrap. But what we're giving your, your machine operators here is the tools to be in charge of their own quality. Cool. Brilliant. Thanks for listening. So what we've got now is probe geometry. So this is using those exact same can cycles as probe WCS. But we're going to do something a little bit special here. This is going to measure a feature that I've just machined. And it's going to tell me if it's out of tolerance and stop the machine. And even it's going to go into the tool library um, on the machine, so the tool table, and update the wear offsets. So if you're using cutter compensation, you can actually start to measure the part that you've just cut and then update that cutter compensation. Again, let's have a quick look at what this looks like. So I've got my pro geometry demo just up here. So what this is gonna allow me to do, it's gonna allow me to measure features that I have just milled. Let's have a quick look. I've got this milling operation, which is going to mill this hole here or this bore, I should probably say, rather than hole. Let's have a quick look at this milling op. I want to show that I've got compensation type set to in control. And I've got a stop to leave left of 0.1. So if I've over or undercut that, I'll actually be able to compensate for that now as I've been going. But that's something very interesting, which we'll hopefully show later, why this is so beneficial to do this in Fusion rather than trying to do this manually with NC code on the machine. So the same as before, inspection, 
But rather than probe WCS, I'm going to hit probe geometry. And what that's going to do now is it's going to create a lovely probe path on that bike. It's going to measure all those four points and measure that for me. Let's go over to actions. And I'm going to tick update tool wear. I now have to select a reference operation. So I go select, I scroll through my list, and I've named this here top semi finish before probe. It's quite handy that I named it that, wasn't it? So this is a big thing out there to everyone. Name your toolpaths. Don't just call them chamfer 16 brackets 4, because what does that mean? So why do we need to set to reference operation? Well, there's a few key bits of information that we need to get this probing right. We need to know what tool am I going to update? Well, what tool did this machine need? Then I need to know, was there any stock to leave? Because bear in mind, this is a 50 millimeter hole. If I leave 0.1 millimeters on that hole, it's no longer a 50 millimeter hole. It's a 49.8 millimeter hole. So when I probe it, I'm not checking against 50 millimeters. I'm checking against 49.8. Something that sounds so simple when I explain it to you, but I've seen a lot of people trip up on this. If they're there trying to handwrite this NC code rather than driving it through Fusion. Again, go back to the point at the start. What we're trying to do here is make probes as easy to use as end mills. So let's click on that reference operation and hit OK. I've now got a minimum update threshold. And again, comment I made earlier, variation is our worst enemy. I don't want my tool update uh, my tool offset, sorry, to be updating for every micron or thou of deviation it finds, because the thing will just be jumping around all day long. You know, nothing is ever made bang on perfect. Well, nothing I do anyway, isn't. So what we want to do is put in a minimum update threshold in here. I'm going to put 10 microns in that box. And what that's going to say is, unless it's 10 microns or above, don't bother updating my toolware because I'm happy to leave it at that level. So all I'm just doing there is giving it a level where unless, it's, unless the deviation is above that from the nominal, it will just think everything's good, let's not go for anything. Right, again, I'm gonna tick these two boxes. Uh, I'm just gonna actually go wrong size, to be honest, because I'm confident in my position, but I'm worried the size might be wrong. So I'm just gonna tick size again on there as well, and then hit okay. So this is my little probe geometry pass. It's just a duplicate of that one there. So let's pop it in the right place. So you can see what I'm going to do here is I'm going to do my semi finishing. I'm going to probe my X and Y and update my tool diameter. And I'm then going to probe my Z and update my tool length on the machine. So imagine this, imagine you're running series of parts, you know, you're churning out five parts every half hour, you know, your tool will wear, and then as it wears, it will deflect more. You know, as it gets a little bit blunt, as the edge gets wearing off, it's gonna deflect more and more and more. So what you need to do is using cutter compensation, you can compensate for that deflection and hopefully bring your part back into spec. So that's something really important here is what this is trying to do. Because you don't wanna be there measuring every single part, going onto your controller, putting the values in and trying to update this. You've got the probe on the machine, let's use it. You know, this is your path to lights out machining. Using probes to functionality like this is what we all need to be doing sooner or later. And then what we've got here is just our finishing passes going on after them. So that's roughly what we've got on here. Hopefully this is all making sense. How are we doing, Spence, in those questions? We're doing good, Rich. A really good presentation so far. We've got one more question come in. Um, oh, just about different types and of machines and different technologies really um the question is would you be able to adapt this technology for other cnc machines other than milling um and the examples were swiss tornos machines or mura okay. lathes okay so at the moment we for this type for these can cycles we are only supporting mills at the moment um very very high on our priority list is getting support out there for lathes so I'm glad you've mentioned some machine names because we're currently looking at a list of what we need to support. And I will bring this up with our PM tomorrow, definitely. But thanks for the question. What I will show us next, you can do on a lathe though. 
Brilliant, thanks. Keep those questions coming in, guys. Is that even one question for me? Are people asleep out there or something? That's it. That's oh. it so far. Come on, everyone. You've got to do better than you know, three mm. questions so far. Perfect. I'll have to start thinking of some really hard questions so I can trip you up a little bit. Oh, thanks, mate. I would, I'd expect nothing less from you. Mm -hmm. Right, so let's go back. Ooh, not into there. Let's go into back into presentation. So what does this look like on the machine? I do run these on machines, by the way. I don't just talk about it all day and, and not try it. We run these on the machine. So this was that part that I made. Um, my, my theory is if I can't do it, how can I preach to people to do it? So this is a really interesting part. It was a resin part and it flexes terribly. So what I've got to do here, you know, is I've got to try and compensate for some of that flex in the part. That's exactly what I've got done there really. So that's compensating for that deflection and, you know, basically just trying to bring any of those errors uh, back in with that compensation. Right, here we get onto the really fun stuff. So non-prismatic freeform. So this now is not using CAN cycles. This is using special post-processors that expand the, the cycles for proper on-machine verification. This is CMM type stuff on a machine. I'm gonna get it out there to start with. The posts we have currently got to support this functionality are Siemens, Heidenhain, Fanuc, and Haas. Um, the Mazak one is going through its last little bit of testing before we, that goes live. Um, and the same for the Datron one as well. So stay tuned for those. Um, they will be out once we're 100% happy that they're safe to do so. But if one of them wasn't listed there, shout it in the chat because I do keep a record of all the requests and that helps us sort out our priority list. So I know there's probably some guy out there with a fadal that's gonna shout in the chat now for me. But this is a little bit different. This is now going to add another step in this process. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use Fusion to create the NC code to run our machine. So we create in Fusion our G code, we hit cycle start, and then rather than the machine just running and making me my part, the machine is now going to make a file. The machine actually makes me a file that we call a results file. And this then gets imported back into Fusion 360 and gives me real graphical representations in Fusion of what we've got. So what does that actually look like? So hopefully this is going to blow some minds out there now. So you can see I've got all my milling ops. Again, this is not a separate inspection package. This is inside of Fusion 360 with all of its CAM functionality. I've got all my toolpaths on there. This is a mold that I'm making. So if there are any mold makers out there, you're probably gonna shriek about me calling this a mold. It was just a demo, please. I'm sorry that some of those corners aren't really mold-like. Um, but anyway, I'll stop ranting at myself. I've just gone to the third one in our list now. So we did probe WCS to start with, probe geometry, we're now doing inspect surface. And as the name suggests, it's all about inspecting surfaces. I'm gonna click anywhere on my part, and then, and then this is the part that I really enjoy. I can drag this now anywhere I want, and it's what we call tracking the surface normal. So you see that blue line? That's gonna be the line that the probe takes. And the reason why we have to track the surface normal is to make sure there isn't something called skidding going on. Imagine if I just probe straight down onto a flat plane, it's going to be fine. But if I've got an angled plane, the probe will skid before it triggers. So that's why we need to make sure that we probe right on that surface normal every time. So let me just chuck a couple of points on here. There we go. A couple of points on there. Um, and there we go. A little fun fact, or well not a fun fact, but a little fun thing to notice is because we have utter control over this, because we're not calling can cycles, we can even have asymmetrical tolerances. So if I want to put that on as 0.8, uh, let's go for eight. I haven't got to have plus or minus as a symmetrical tolerance or a unilateral, if you will, if you're feeling a bit posh. I can have asymmetrical. So plus one value and minus another. Brilliant. And that's all I have to do. I'm going to right click on that toolpath and create an NC program. 
So let's have a quick look at what a normal post looks like now for inspection. So they do require a tiny amount of configuring. So this is a Haas one I've got up here, for example. And looking at this, what I need to do is tell it three values. So calibrated radius, eccentricity, and X and Y. Now I'm fairly confident that most machines out there use these values. But if there are any problems, hit us up on our support channels or on the forums and we'll do our best to help you out. But these are the calibration values that you should know from your probe manufacturer. Then the probe on and off commands. Again, these are the standard ones that Renishaw uses. But if you've got a different one, hopefully when they installed their probe, they told you maybe it's like M62 or something else. But hopefully you guys know that. If not, again, hit us up on the, on the forums or the product chat and we'll do our best to help you through this. One thing for any of you that are doing out there, there yourselves, this will be ticked by default. It's called inspection commissioning mode. And what it does is it puts some um, breaks in the NC code and gives you some helpful messages. So for example, when the probe should have enabled, it will stop and it will say, has the probe enabled? And you go, oh no, it hasn't, I've got a problem. So it's just in there. Again, that's what that checkbox is. I say, use it once or twice. Once you're happy that everything's working properly, you can turn that off. It will just stop the machine having to pause every time it gives you a message. So let's post-process this. And what we see now is some NC code. Doesn't that look absolutely brilliant? So it doesn't actually, does it? But what we've got here is basically just a move. A G31 move is a probe G1 move. So it's actually called a high speed skip move for anyone that's really into their G code out there, but I'm not gonna get into that. But then what we have to do is we can't just go G31 X minus 57. We have to use that calibration value that we put in before, which is stored on your machine, just to compensate for errors in the probe. So the person asked about CMMs earlier, you know, because you have to calibrate a CMM, you calibrate your probes in the same way. And we have to make sure that we harness, you know, those calculations. We don't want to be, you know, guessing with our probes. We want to make sure they're as damn near accurate as we can get them. So all I do is in a macro variable number two, I just store that value. And then I command to go to that value. Again, that's all I'm going to talk about NC code for at the moment, because I could waste far too much time talking through the ins and outs of it. So I'd run that NC code on our machine tool. What our machine tool would do then is kick back a results file. Now, unfortunately, I haven't got a machine tool in my spare bedroom, but what I have got is a inspect surface results generator post processor. You can download this from our online library. So click on this link here, takes you to our online library, search for results generator, and you can download it. What it will do is it will use a random number generator um, around this value and it will kick you back your very own results file like this. So this is the results file you will get from your machine tool. All you need to care about is that it starts with a start and ends with an end. If there are ever, ever any problems, that's the first thing you look for. But all being well, you should never even have to look at this. So let me quickly just import that. So let me just find out where this is kept. Kept on the good old desktop where everything goes in my life because I'm not organized enough. So let's now go actions, import inspection results, and I'm just gonna quickly choose that file. And look at that. I've instantly got a load of results graphically brought back into Fusion. How nice is that? What I can do now is right click, show results, and I can interrogate this interactively as well. So I can see the parts that are all out of tolerance there. Spence, I hope there are some wows in the chat at the moment. I've actually got no questions, oh. um, but <laughs> you're doing an awesome job. I, I've got a couple of questions for you, just to try and uh, get some action going in the chat window. Um, two questions. Do we support all different types of probes, so um, strains, kinematics? Yes, we do. Question. Easy one. Uh, Next. Oh, I thought that was going to be hard. Second one, uh, what about manufacturers of probes? 
Okay, that's a really good question. So when it comes down to manufacturers of probes, this inspect surface kind of thing actually matters less because we're doing it in the NC code itself. We're not calling CAN cycles. We're taking ownership of how that probe should be driven. So the manufacturer matters less at this point now. It's more about the controller. We go back to the CAN cycles. That's more about the manufacturer than the controller because they put those CAN cycles on there. That's a good question, mate. You, uh, you're trying to trip me up a bit. I can feel it. Cool. Uh, Let me go just, on. Just, for, just for your um, uh, pride, you've had three wow questions just come in. Thanks. I've got at least three people watching. I mean, that's not <laughs> yeah. bad. And a total of uh, seven wow, seven votes on those three wows, Rich. So, oh, like, okay. That, that, that's not too bad. At least seven. Cheers, everyone. You've you're making a Brit happy over here. Right, I'm going to crack on. I've only got nine minutes left. So this is brilliant, but what if I haven't got Fusion? Um, as in, what if um, you know, the inspector or my customer hasn't got Fusion and they need to see these results? I can right-click, save inspection report. Let's quickly save this here. And what I get now is a PDF printable document that can go along with that part. So again, some more wows are due for me at the moment. Um, I can send this off um, to our customer and show them the quality of the parts I'm doing as well. Right, last thing I'm gonna show you, I promise, and then I'm gonna let you all go on with the day. And that's manual measure. So this is nothing to do with probes, but it complements them brilliantly. So I've got this part here. I've actually got it in front of me. Look how prepared I am. This is, this is rare for me. And I can now use hand tools to inspect this part. I can make the routine and I can repeat that 50 times a day, 100 times a day for years and years on end. And I can save all this data inside of Fusion 360. Let's have a quick look. So here I have got my part. Let's get rid of what I've done previously because uh, I want to show you how good this really is. I've got some inspect surface toolpaths on there. So I inspected those bits on the machine, but I then have got my digital calipers in front of me and I'm gonna measure a few different things on here. So I'm now gonna go from inspection to manual measure. So let's create a manual measure. Let's click on these two sides. I'm now gonna place the view where I want it to go and hit record camera position. Let's give it a quick name. I won't bother naming the others because I'm running out of time. Um, let's give it a bit of a tighter tolerance than that because hopefully I can machine better than 100 microns. Um, and then comments are going to be use calipers. Right, let's whiz through and let's add some more dimensions on here. So let's move that camera position around. Let's show how gorgeous it looks. And let's do the drop from here to here. Oh, I don't like the position of that. Let's drop that just there for me. That's looking nicer. And I want that to be, again, back up there. Record that camera position for me. Um, I now want to add a little bit of pass fail on. So I want to check those M6 holes. Um, oh, I want M6, not M weird upwards arrow. Um, use thread gauge. Perfect. Then let's hit another one on here. Let's do a text. Let's call it um, no burrs. Ensure path is free of burrs. Actually, that should be a pass fail, shouldn't it? So let's just change that to a pass fail. That was easy. And then last text one, inspect name. Perfect. Okay, right, I've got six minutes to show you how amazing this is, answer any questions on it. I tell you what, if the last stuff didn't wow you, be prepared for this now. So I'm going to right click and go record manual inspection. You can see then the CAD view automatically came to what I recorded that, that image as. I'm going to hold my part. I'm going to hold my calipers. These are Bluetooth calipers. So are you ready for this, everyone? Uh, I feel like a magician at the moment. I'm going to hold them on backwards because I can, hit the data button and it automatically populates the value and goes on to the next feature. Spence, I bet you can't cope with all the chatter at the moment about this. 
unbelievable. I'm saving him to the end. Right, let's quickly do this inside bore. Hit the data button. Oh no, I can't measure that reliably with my calipers. However, because I'm one of those weird people, under my desk, I've actually got a height gauge here. So there we go. Who says we don't go the extra mile here? So let's set this up. Let's just datum it on the top there. Let's zero that and let's go down to there. And I've got 8.01. How lovely was that? So that's not Bluetooth. That's just a normal device. So I just use the keyboard to type in the value and hit next. M6 holes. Yes, I've checked those quickly, didn't I? Um, no burrs. Nope, looks all good to me. Let's pass on that. Inspector name is R Stubbly. And okay. So what I've now got is just using a load of hand tools, I've inspected my part. And I can see I've got some problems here. My hole is too small, hence it's blue. Those are too big, hence they're red. And that one is just right. And the same as before, I can right click, save inspection report. Let's just save this locally again. And I've got a lovely report that can be now kept in a system somewhere, or it can be shipped off to my customer, or I can just leave it in Fusion forever and a day. And I've got four minutes left. Look at that. Go on, Spence. Hit me up with some questions. Awesome job. Loads. Loads, Rich. Uh, I'll do the easy ones first. So two votes for a brilliant. Uh, two votes for an amazing. Two votes for a what? <laughs> one vote for a nice, one vote for a wow. And now we'll get into the real questions. Can so, you screenshot that for me? I, you know what? I accidentally didn't. Oh. <laughs> First question, eight votes in this is, uh, you guys are doing great. Well done. So we'll, we'll, take, a bit, we'll take a bit of that. Um, uh, somebody else also stores everything on their desktop. So you're not alone. Uh, six <laughs> votes on that. Uh, a real question, is the report customizable? No, it's not at the moment. Um, I can't say much more, but watch out for updates. Um, it is going to be customizable to a degree. We are definitely looking at that. But thanks for, for pushing us in the, that right direction. Dangle the garret, Rich. I love it. Uh, four votes for uh, where can I find a probing post? Cool. Okay, perfect. So let me just hit that share share button again. Let's show you where you can grab those. So, right, if you do any post-processing, uh, let's edit that NC program, there is this hyperlink here that takes you directly to our online library. So let's just open that up. Here we go. So that's going to open up. If you type in inspect in here, you can see all the inspection posts. So Hass inspection, Hass next gen control, that results file generator, the fan at the hide and hide, the Siemens, those are all capable of doing the inspect surface toolpaths. As far as the CAN cycles go, that's embedded into the normal milling posts. So the easiest way of seeing if it's in there is just try and post out a toolpath and see if it works. It will say it's not supported and it will need to be handled properly if it's not. That's the easiest way. Go on to our online library and type in inspect. All right. Awesome. And that's it. All right. Well, thank you very much, guys. I'm, I'm blown away. <laughs> this is amazing. Um, so this concludes our presentation on CNC probing inside of Fusion Cam. On behalf of SolidCAD, uh, we want to thank again our two experts from Autodesk UK for taking the time to demonstrate this. Um, now, please take the time to visit the exhibitors at the virtual expo between 3 and 3.30. And then afterwards, I hope you can join us for the um, presentation on, on robotics and automated CNC cells. And then followed, that's followed by a presentation on TrueNest uh, sheet material cutting. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Spencer. Cheers, everyone. Thanks. Really appreciate the time today.